Benedict, how are you doing, my love? Have you got the lurgy? Are you okay? I don't have the lurgy, no. Or at least not yet. I mean, maybe. Who knows? Uh, who knows? Well, yeah, but you're it could, safe. It could creep up on you at any moment in this city. I know, I know. It's, you're safe the other end of a Zoom, so uh, I'd keep your distance if I was you. I'll tell you what it is. We haven't been drinking enough cider together lately. That's where I haven't been getting my vitamins, and uh, it's uh, laid me to waste. Right, I keep asking you to go, and you're just like, oh, yeah, sure, maybe next week. Yeah, maybe it'll happen. I'm so busy, and now you're yeah. ill. See? See? Yeah. yeah. No, it's karma. Get? It's apple-based karma. I tell you that much. <laughs> I know it is. I've been uh, letting go of my good West Country principles. Shame on me. Now, talking about shame on, what do you make of this fact that um, there is a very young Labour MP, uh, thought to be um, one of the wealthiest, actually, uh, Henry Tufnell is his name. He was elected in Mid and South of Pembrokeshire. Well, his mm. parents seem to have a 20 million quid farm. And just before the budget, or just before the announcement that farmers were going to pay inheritance tax, his parents miraculously decided to transfer the entire family estates to his brother, thus avoiding... Uh, having to pay up on the tax on uh, 20 million quid's worth of um, farmland being handed over. Do you smell a rat here? I mean, what I would say is that I'd be more concerned if this hadn't happened because it would betray a lack of ability to think laterally amongst our political class uh, that would put me slightly in an uneasy position. So at least they're smart enough to do that in advance. Obviously, obviously this is slightly untoward. That's the thing, is yeah, that everybody will be looking at this and going, hang on, what's going on here? Has, has, has somebody been given the sort of the heads up? But having said that, when you're talking about sort of farms and estates of a certain size, you know, we're not talking here about a sort of a small uh, or to medium-sized farm holding. This is a significant chunk of land. The super wealthy are always one step ahead of government anyway, and that's partly why uh, the, the new rules around farm, farmland and inheritance tax um, is quite so ridiculous. This, is ne this was never going to be something that caught out the gentleman farmers, the super rich, the people who do it to avoid inheritance tax. It was only ever going to catch out those people who do not, in fact, yeah. have... Um, a, a tax advisor on speed dial and for whom it's not actually in their interest or hasn't been up to now to have one. So on the one hand, I think I can say, yeah, not a good look. Obviously, it's not a good look. But on the other hand, this is exactly the sort of cohort of person that I would expect to be making sure that they weren't going to end up paying inheritance tax one way or another anyway. Yeah, amazing, actually, how many people with coins in the bank account were scrambling ahead of the budget to try and uh, squirrel money away and move it around before taxes hit. Uh, but like you said, that's what the super wealthy are able to do. It's the rest of us poor old sods who don't have a coin to our name who uh, end up falling foul of these schemes more often than not. Now, let's talk about... Louise Haig, because this is this just goes from bad to worse. She, of course, is the transport secretary who's had to resign, saying she didn't want to cause a distraction. This is after it was revealed. Police investigated her for what they believed to potentially be insurance fraud. She was working for an insurance company at the time, said she was mugged, said uh, a handset had been stolen and made a claim for it. And then later on, this uh, handset pinged its location out and it happened to still be in her house, in a drawer. And she went, oh, sorry, I didn't realise that. Other reports that I've read seem to say mobile phones, zzz, plural, which makes you wonder what's really going on here. Because for the police to be called in to investigate something like this seems a bit weird, unless they thought it was on a, a far greater scale than just one little case of um, accidentally saying something got nicked when it didn't. Or that if you get mugged and you don't realise what's been nicked, that to me is a bit weird. You kind of notice if your phone would have gone, surely. You know, you yeah. use your phone all the time. You would notice if it had gone, but I don't know. Well, she said she did nothing wrong. She was let off at the time. They couldn't find any evidence or whatnot. It, it now transpires that police have looked at metadata uh, attached to a photograph that she supposedly took of this stolen mobile phone, but it shows that the photograph of said phone was taken after the phone had been stolen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I heard this at the time and I just thought it's very classically incompetent, frankly. it's Well, one thing I would say is that uh, I'm delighted to hear that the Metropolitan Police is finally taking the idea of mobile crime, uh, phone-related crime seriously. You know, decades later, it turns out, and they're only doing it on a case-by-case -case basis, but it turns out that they do have the resources to investigate this. So next time you have your phone stolen and the police give you that little crime number and then they say, sorry, there's not enough evidence, we all know that that's not true. Um, honestly, though, it, it's, it's the stupidity. It's the stupidity in the 
pettiness of it and the thought that oh i can get away with this or you know i you know not talking to the prime minister about it, the prime minister potentially not being aware or even the prime minister being aware and thinking it'll be it'll blow over it's not right. that big a deal and it's that that seems to be the thing really that it has sort of characterized this government since it's come in there have not been any you know, titanically huge scandals. There have been lots of little things sort of bubbling al away along the surface and lots of people saying, well, how much longer is it going to be until something big actually does come out? Because there is, there is this amount, this scale of behaviour where MPs are effectively going, ah, who's going to notice? Or ah, everyone does it. And we're talking about things like a mobile phone potentially being stolen, potentially not. We're talking about donations from a billionaire peer. What actually is there else that's hiding under the surface? Because there is rather too much of this going on. We're really early still in, in into this into this new government's tenure. It's only going to snowball from here, and they're sort of already dropping the ball. Um, and of course, Angela Rayner and her housing uh, uh, situation as well. You know, is it just going to keep on being a rolling trend? The other thing, of course, is what are going to be the standards to which different MPs, different ministers are held? Why is it one rule potentially for one person and another for somebody else? And some people might say, well, what, for instance, Rachel Reeves was accused of doing wasn't as serious as what Louise Hayer has been accused of doing. Oh, fair enough, but still. She is the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Just because, you know, it's slightly lesser offence doesn't mean that, you know, it, it's fine. So right. we are already in really bumpy territory, and that is quite forgetting all of the policy disasters that they've been trying to rush through. This is the thing. This government are just thick. They're thick. They are. They're B-grade. They're incompetent. They're sixth-form debating society, second-rate embarrassments. It makes you yearn for the past government, who at least had a few brain cells between them. They might have been some egotistical, venal, posh boys playing politics and parlor games on the taxpayers' quid. But the people we've got in at present, once upon a time, you'd look at the role of prime minister or look at the role of foreign secretary, and you'd think, wow. Imagine doing that one day. Would I be the sort of person who'd be capable of, uh, you know, having that huge esteemed role, that office mm. of state representing the country on the international stage, the most important jobs in the land? You look at the lot sitting around Sir Keir Starmer's cabinet table, you wouldn't even have them as dog walkers. They're I... utterly feckless and useless. The other day during the assisted suicide debate, Lots of people were sort of pontificating, going, this is Parliament at its best, this is the House at its best, because there were some MPs who were making very good speeches and very good interventions. But what really struck me was, in fact, that this is not Parliament at its best, because maybe a third, maybe half, were making very good interventions. And the other half genuinely didn't seem to understand the legislation, certainly didn't seem to have read the legislation. And I think we really are now in that territory where you do have a lot of them. Of course, there are always going to be very talented people drawn to politics, but a critical mass of MPs, and people may say that I'm sounding a little snobbish or a little, a little elitist, fine. A critical mass of MPs are simply people who have climbed the party rungs. They've met the right people, they've been friends with the right people, they've done the right amount of canvassing. They are not necessarily very talented people. And frankly, have no real business representing tens of thousands of constituents or making these decisions. And I'm sorry, again, people may say that this is my own political bias coming through. What we saw uh, during that debate were some MPs who gave this a lot of moral thought and a lot of practical thought and a lot of other MPs who are just there for the ride. Yeah, and it's a matter of life and death as well. It's yeah. not like, oh, just a little thing, I don't really understand it. I remember there was that intervention, I can't remember which woke lefty it Catherine was, saying, Eccles. don't use the word suicide. And Danny Catherine Kruger had Eccles. to turn around and say, yeah, this is actually amending the Suicide Act, you absolute yeah, Catherine, idiot. Catherine Eccles, the MP for Stour bridge um you know somebody who is a, a new mp so perhaps can be forgiven for a degree of immaturity but i think it really did speak to the priorities you're right the priorities of somebody who when discussing whether or not the state should be allowed to intervene to take people's lives was more offended at the use of the technical term suicide which is the correct technical term than about what was actually being discussed What's going on in France? Talking about incompetency here. Well, Michel Barnier, <laughs> never a man to really love democracy, is he? He was, of course, the EU's uh, top negotiator during those Brexit years. Um, so the idea of accountability in the nation state and, uh, you know, the operations of a uh, national government, uh, not really things he really believes in. Well, it turns out he's used special powers as a Premier Ministre of France to push through a social security budget bill without a vote, which which could now trigger a vote of no confidence in him. It's 
I mean, I, I tell you what, there is something rather exciting about French politics. At some point, every French head of state has his Napoleon moment where he thinks, actually, I am the state. I can do whatever I want. I can just sort of bludgeon my way through. And, you know, we see this at various other uh, levels as well. We don't get away from the fact. I know that we like to talk about the, the tyranny of the petty bureau bureaucrats in the UK, but in France, they almost feel as if there's, you know, so, uh, it, it almost feels as if it's expected of them at some point, um, which is fair enough. It's a cultural difference, but it is rather interesting coming only a few months of course after mr macron called that sort of snap poll um uh, 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 and uh, uh, and it, things have just been sort of disintegrating for him ever since um which is unusual in, in many ways I, given that actually i think mr macron is respected broadly as much as we may disagree with him politically as one of the more able politicians and actually one of the more stable politicians and you know to have this whilst the german government collapses whilst britain sort of lurches from one crisis to another it just adds to the picture of a continent that is not really well at ease with itself is facing very difficult questions with an incoming trump administration that's decided it's going to impose possibly a tariff war on it and is also saying to them you need to buck up your ideas on defense with with the Ukrainian regime saying to the Russians, we, we may be prepared to cede territory, which will sell a lot of Europe downriver, given how it's positioned itself. And with it also, many of its members uh, positing itself in rather awkward positions when it comes to what's happened with Israel and now, of course, potentially facing the new crisis in Syria. Europe is at a, at a moment where it's stuck in the mud in a quagmire and it just doesn't know what it is. Its identity is shattered. Um, and the direction that it's going to go in, is it going to lurch to the right, as The Guardian's always telling us it's about to do? Is it going to actually, you know, are the centrists going to hold as they perpetually do? And, you know, as, as with France, as goes the rest of the European Union. Yeah, and to have the two major powers of Europe, France mm. and Germany, both on the ropes at the same time, it's rather exciting, in a way. Oh, it's nice to be it? Well, perhaps people aren't that <laughs> stupid. Perhaps all the so-called populists who said, we want things to be done differently, we don't want these anti-democratic globalists running our countries, driving us into the ground, open borders and all the rest of it. We want to go back to what we were used to, a bit of sort of, you know, common, common sense, pragmatic centre-right politics. Perhaps they're not so idiotic and if governments listened to them and allowed them to have their de democratic wants, Europe wouldn't be in so much trouble. Uh, now, Sakir Starmer has had to drop a flagship pledge would you believe it? Um, which was, you have to laugh, to make Britain the fastest growing nation in the G7. How are you going to do that, Kia? How are we going to really grow the UK economy really quickly? I know, Lex tax employment. Yeah. I, I, mean, it's I had just... to drop it because it was a lie, <laughs> basically. Ridiculous. I mean, uh, it's... Look, we, it's very easy to sort of get into the sort of the doom and gloom when it comes to the UK economy, but we don't do that because it's easy. We do that because that's the genuine reality of what we face. Britain should be an energy independent country with some of the lowest prices in the world. It has chosen to have the most expensive energy prices in the world and the most regressive, frankly, when it comes to renewable energy policies. We are taxing ourselves at a level that is unheard of out of, war, out of wartime and unnecessary, frankly. And for what? Not for improving services for keeping services afloat we are you know creating a, 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 a an asylum system that is unfit for purpose and that is draining the exchequer of billions every year we have created a situation where the benefits system and i know they've renamed it but it is the good old benefit system is at a titanic level the amount of money that is being taken out of the system a lot of it fraudulently and and as, you know sort of in its totality we are frightening off businesses already based here and businesses from overseas that might be inclined to invest in us and i understand the reasons why labor think they have to do this because it's baked into their ideology but honestly what the tories did for the last 14 years is just going to carry on at a slightly faster pace under labor that's all that we have now yeah, I mean, it just seems to me across the whole of the West, everyone's become sort of woe-begotten, weak-willed and wimpish, you know, not standing well, up for things anymore, saying, oh, do you know what? We're not going to just hand out money to people who don't want to work. You can't just break into the country. Please don't smoke cannabis in the I, street. I mean, it's just madness. Everything's I just gone say, soft. I would say that the election of Donald <clears> Trump, <throat> and I say this is somebody who is incredibly cautious about him just as a prospect and his ideology, I do think that this is going to be different from last time. I think it's going to be a lot more aggressive, a lot more expansive. I don't think it's going to be so much America first. I do think there is going to be a concerted effort from certain wings of the Republican Party and the tech bro industry, if you like, to have a lot more influence in what goes on in Europe. I think that they are waking up there 
to the direction that many Western countries are going in. And, you know, in much the same way as China has created its own sphere of influence with the Belt and Road Initiative, I think that the United States will try to do the same thing, and it will drag certain Western countries kicking and screaming uh, into its orbit, especially if they decide that they don't want to sort of p pursue these things. And this is one of the things when it comes about talking about Britain's relationship with the EU and what's happening in the EU, if you choose managed decline, which is what we in Europe are choosing, you can't then complain when a bigger, stronger player comes along, puts you in a headlock and goes, well, you're going to do what we want you right. to do now because that's your future and that is what will happen. Well, don't you worry because uh, uh, Sakir Sam has got the best idea of how to shake things up in government. That's right. He's got a new head of the civil service replacing Simon Case, uh, who's been cabinet secretary since 2020. He's standing down due to ill health. They're bringing in someone called Sir Chris Warmold. He is the new cabinet secretary, 56 years old. But the problem with older old Sir Chris Warmold is he's been around the block a lot of times. He's got a lot of, let's say, political baggage. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, find me a civil servant these days who a senior civil servant these days who doesn't come with a lot of baggage. I think it sort of comes with the territory. It's one of those things where, on the one hand, this really does matter because these are the individuals who actually run our country, and so their background and what they've been involved in, uh, be it anything to do with COVID or any of the other things uh, that are on the rap sheet. And of course, because civil servants tend to get shuffled around different departments, you'll tend to find that lots of them have been across all sorts of things uh, that perhaps uh, the public wouldn't be too happy with. But on the one hand, it's very important who it is that's very high up in the civil service obviously as i say these are the people that really run the country not the politicians on the other hand because we don't really have any recourse to removing these people unless you somehow elect a prime minister who is prepared to sack everybody which just doesn't happen it's one of those very frustrating things where you 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 see the names of the individuals and you recognize who they are because they've been in this department or that department but all you can do is shrug because it's not like you can get that person out at the next election because governments keep these people around because they need to keep the civil service on side, or at least that's what they feel they need to do. Uh, so, you know, Chris Warmold, congratulations. There's nothing we can do about these people until we get a prime minister or a government that is absolutely hell-bent above anything else on civil service reform rather than its own ideological struggles. Benedict, thank you ever so much, my darling. Uh, you've saved me a few moments of a conversation through my sort of catarred up state.